Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm Garen Jagodin from Tallinn, Estonia, from the Museum of Occupations and Freedom. And first of all, I would really like to thank the Sibelius Hall for hosting us here, and of course the staff of NEMO for organizing and putting together this excellent conference. Thank you, it's been a lovely, lovely day so far. Um, for once, I can feel really good uh, by coming to a conference and, and uh, sustainable in coming to a conference because as coming from Tallinn, I only needed to take a short ferry and train ride. Yet at the same time, I'm standing here with my papers in a paperless sustainability conference because I'm exactly the person who goes in the morning into the hotel reception and asks, maybe you can print out six pages for me because otherwise I'm lost. So are we really sustainable only in the amount that is convenient to us? And are the museums sustainable only in the amount that is convenient to the museums? Uh, today's second panel, part of the problem, uh, doesn't really argue that there isn't enough knowledge in the field. Uh, mostly there is not enough action, or is there enough action? Um, how can we lead as museums uh, this change in the society that is so evident and needed? Today there's been already a lot of talk and examples on maybe really, really need to unlearn a few things or really flip our perspectives, really change the way we think. Um, so I have changed a lot of my notes within that uh, first part of the day and it really left me wondering that uh, what is it what we can really flip because uh, we as museum people, we work with uh, national heritage and, and uh, heritage and uh, materials that belong to our nations. And um, if the nation owns that uh, heritage, then it's more actually for me a question of trust, that do we also trust our people? So if you really need to flip perspectives, then why don't we hand uh, the role of being a caregiver, uh, a keeper of that heritage also to our people. So could one of the ways to really flip our perspectives be that uh, our heritage doesn't necessarily need to be in museums. I wouldn't mind having a few nice paintings at my home, in my living room. I could take good, take, take good care of them and I believe a lot more people could do that. Is this the way we really need to start rethinking about how we take care of our heritage and, uh, and our uh, collections? So there's going to be a lot of different uh, interesting discussions here today about uh, how the collections should be preserved, how and why we should be building new museums or how we should transform our organizations. And my job here is just to provoke some questions and, uh, and see that uh, we do get this discussion going, especially now after lunch. But I'm honored to welcome now uh, on stage uh, Stefan Simon, uh, trained as heritage scientist, a scientist. He's been working since 2005 as a director of the Radkland Research Laboratory with the National Museums Berlin. Uh, Stefan has prioritized the advancements of sustainable conservation strategies triggered by global climate change and the Green Museum debate. He calls himself a pessimist but I think that this is a reflection of his deep concern that we are not doing enough and the time is running out. And in his presentation, Simon will argue that climate crisis has arrived in our European museums and that it is about time for museums in Europe to finally look up and realign their priorities. So, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen, and also thank you to the organizers for bringing me here in a quite unsustainable way by plane from Berlin because the train connection takes like 38 hours plus. I was flying in one hour and 15 minutes. Um, yeah, well, let me start by saying that it's 30 years, more than 30 years, since the World Summit of Rio de Janeiro was convened in order to fight dangerous human interference with the climate system by stabilizing carbon emissions and also eight years after the Paris Climate Accord was signed, which by now has been joined by 194 nations plus the European Union, a legally binding accord. And yeah, as Karen said, look up, it's about us, not about the climate. First of all, we in the cultural sector must understand that the climate crisis is real, that it has already begun in parts of the world, and is claiming not only in my home 
state of Bavaria uh, in this 10 minutes hail event in August, where literally all the roofs were smashed of Benedict Boyan, including the ancient windows in the monastery and the roof. So it has already begun in parts of the world and it's claiming victims more and more every day. Secondly, it's ourselves and nobody else who caused it, and it's especially us in the global north. It is also unprecedented as a crisis, and it's a very serious threat to our civilization around the globe. And I'm illustrating this with pictures from Germany and abroad of the last one or two years. The last thing which we have to understand is that the climate crisis will change everything we are familiar with and will not stop at the doorsteps of our museums. The storms which we experienced end of June in Berlin, and this photo got kind of viral, caused damage, especially water damage, in almost a dozen of our museums. We have 17, almost a dozen of our museums in the Prussian Heritage Foundation. So could we perhaps ask ourselves what is worse for museums, climate change or climate activism? Once we understand this, we can ask ourselves, what can we do in the museums? Maybe it's more, more important to make use of the potential of museums as an agora to debate together about this most important challenge of our time, speak not only but also to climate activists, as we did that in summer in Berlin. The art critic Valdemir Januszczak is credited with the quote that the new museum buildings is not longer a boom, it's an orgy. Apparently, more museums were built in the still young 21st century than in the 19th and 20th century combined. And every year, around 700 new museums are created in China alone. If we were just talking about the museum building spree, it's worth mentioning that it takes many decades until a new museum, even if it's built according to the Platinum Lead or BREEAM, or in Germany we have the BNB um, standard, can be operated with the lowest amount of energy, it takes many decades until it catches up with the reused old building in terms of emissions. Too much of carbon dioxide is produced when burning cement, melting steel, alumina glass, and all the logistics connected to a new building. This so-called grey energy is difficult to estimate in the long term because the non-renewable energy content of repair and replacement materials it's difficult to predict how, how energy intensive will be the production of building materials in a few decades, which are contributions of grey energy that arise during demolition and disposal, and is there a model for an appropriate quantification, especially for historic buildings? There's many question marks. And as time increases, operational energy becomes more important. Strategies to reduce energy consumption throughout the life cycle should be therefore based on design considerations that significantly reduce the building operational energy. On the other hand, as energy consumption for operations tends to fall, the grey energy again will become more important in the overall view of the life cycle of buildings. If half of the greenhouse gases are generated during the construction, demolition and operation as of buildings, as Max Page from Boston is saying, efforts to maintain existing buildings will become a cornerstone of any sustainability strategy. So the reason of the high carbon footprint of museums is hidden in their cellars and roofs. It is the complex air conditioning that is traditionally based much more on what is technically feasible and less on conservation needs. My colleague Wukash will elaborate on that in his statement, so I can skip this and continue. Let me only illustrate one particularly absurd feature of air conditioning. In many museums we heat when it's hot and we're cool, when it's freezing outside. On the right, you have a typical sawtooth curve for a single set point temperature control in museums. According to studies we did together with Wukash Bratash and the Yale Peabody Museum six years ago, approximately 20, 30% of energy can be saved simply by allowing for a drift between two set point temperatures. We build and we are continually expanding our own institute's um, database for benchmarking energy consumption of museums, thanks to the contribution of many of your members. 
this enables you to classify your energy consumption in national and international comparison. Well, over the recent years, the median, the average, dropped below 300 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. But you can see in this diagram that a climate neutral museum is supposed to not use more than 30, 40, maybe 50 kilowatt hours per year. So we still have really way to go. Let's take a look at Mies van der Rohe's Neue Nationalgalerie in Berlin, an architectural icon. After its renovation two years ago, it consumes approximately 30% more energy than before. This is something you don't hear about. You hear that this renovation is collecting architectural awards. You don't hear that the cooling energy at the Kulturforum, where we have several museums, not just this one, has increased by almost 50% since we ran this museum again. So the new National Gallery can be credited with opening a few years before the publication of the first report of the Club of Rome, 1972, or the first oil crisis, 1973. At that time, limitless consumption of resources was considered a viable option. Well, we don't do that anymore, do we? But has really anything changed? Just next to the new National Gallery, and so are many plans for new museum buildings around the world, not just in Germany. Many of these plans seem strangely fallen out of time. The German weekly, Der Freitag, attested to this most climate hostile building of our history, which is currently being built, um, the charm of a hairspray with fluorinated hydrocarbons from the 1970s. Again and again, when I pass by and I look at the slowly progressing construction works at the Kulturforum, I ask myself about the logic of this failure. We know that we will not be able to operate this house as planned. We know that we cannot afford it. We know that the best new museum that can be built today, for all the reasons described, is the one that we decide actually not to build. When in 1967 the new National Gallery in almost finished, the construction work of the National Library on the opposite side of the Kulturforum just begins, there are still many areas open open fields where we today have the painting gallery, the Arts and Crafts Museum, the Prints and Drawings, the Musical Instruments Museum, the Ibero-American Institute. The last piece of green surface at the Kulturforum in the middle is now being filled with concrete. We know that we should not have sealed this. What we notice instead, trees in flower pots, which are symbolic for our understanding of how we understand the ecological transformation of our museums. This is not going to work. What is clear is that the solutions for the crisis will not be found in the same unsustainable models that have put the planet in ever more acute danger in recent decades. So what can we do? The classification of real climates, for example, that we can currently offer to all museums, archives, free of charge. We evaluate room climatic conditions according to standards and recommendations such as ASHRAE, the German Museumsbund, and BISO. If you I can give you a little glimpse into the project in progress after we carried out about 100 evaluations. Most museums so far fall into the ASHRAE class C, some into B, none so far in the A classes, which so many museums believe that they're actually in. More than half of the evaluated cases are from Germany, mainly from museums with a majority actually being air conditioned. There is a clear and stunning discrepancy between the existing recommendations and the climate reality in our museums. In less than 10% of the case studies so far, humidity fluctuation, for example, could be kept consistently below 10% a day. In many cases, it's hard to control climate even within the corridors that were supposedly expanded too widely in the recommendation. What does this mean for us? It means we need to be honest and transparent about our climate conditions and energy consumption. We should participate in benchmarking efforts like this one, which you can, by the way, access via the QR code. While we have achieved a change in consciousness, we heard that today in the climate debate, it's time to better recognize the urgency and to apply risk management tools to all the questions of museum sustainability. And at the end of the day, and it's just a personal experience, don't fall for greenwashing. 
Greenwashing is just adding insult to injury. It's about protecting us, the people, and not the climate. So I want to finish with the ABC method, which I learned from my colleagues at New Scotland Yard, when we, because you know, a big part of my work is <laughs> devoted to authenticity in art. So the a ABC and forgeries and fakes and, and, and art crime. The ABC method means assume nothing, believe nobody, and check everything. Thank you very much. Stay there. Stay here. Thank you, Stefan. Before I let you uh, off and uh, give floor to the next presentation, I have one question to you. I think I heard from a lot this audience this sound that you would like to... You, you reacted, you responded to, to his arguments. Uh, there was this kind of willingness to, to react and do something. Um, there are people who are striking against climate change, and some of the museums aren't really having good uh, experiences, on the other hand, with those people who, uh, who strike for the climate change. Is there anything we should learn from them? Should we collaborate with climate uh, change activists so that we could feel that we also are doing actually something or we, we can use their voice? It's not an easy question. I, I, I think it's not um, so easy to, to, to reply to this. I think personally that we must engage with climate activists because they, they see things much more clearer than my own minister of culture or the politicians or not even speak about the fossil fuel industry, right? So I think listening to them is a good way. I do not share many of the methods they are applying in their actions in our museums. Uh, I learned that they are not targeting museums, they're using us as a stage in Germany. Um, but I, my, my experience is that the moment they were gluing themselves to the first paintings in Berlin in last August, I wrote to my boss and I said, can we just, you know, I have connections to these people. I think they are young people, they are fighting for democracy, they are fighting for the survival of the civilization. Shouldn't we talk to them over a coffee? The first reaction of my boss was, you know, this is really dangerous because if people find out that I'm meeting with them, that would be difficult for me in the German community that I talk to them. But then after a few months, I got this short message from my director and said, Stefan, I think now... I want to meet them. And we met, and we discussed, and we don't have to share all the views. But personally, I'm convinced we should always keep in mind that maybe in a few decades, our children and our grandchildren, they may be really grateful to these people, whatever they did disturbing our world now. I think um, if we are very lucky, our grandchildren can be happy and grateful to them. Thank you. <laughs> Our next presenter will join us uh, online, virtually. Uh, I hope you can already see and hear us, uh, Lukasz Pratac. Um, from Poland, from the Jersey Harbor Institute of Catalysis and Surface Chemistry and Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Professor Lukas Bratac has for many years headed the research laboratory at the National Museum in Krakow and is currently the head of the Cultural Heritage Research Group at the Polish Academy of Sciences. And his presentation, Be Honest, Objects Survived Centuries in Unstable Environments, debates about the more responsible use of energy in museums. So the three distinct questions to raise are what do we want, know and can. So the floor is yours, Lukas, if you are here. Yes, thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Karen, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I would like also to thank the organizer for inviting me to this important conference and giving me possibility to present my research results, but also research results of other colleagues. And the research results I will talk about are related to the climate control in museums and in general in memory institutions. In general, the decision-making process about the climate control in memory institution is complex one. As you can see here on this scheme, you have several uh, stages. And of course, the scheme was developed and proposed by the ASHRAE, uh, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning engineers who designed and proposed the guidelines for new Museums, libraries, 
galleries and archives, and they are the most influential guide, environmental guidelines for museums globally. And as you can see here, the process is really complex. A lot of stakeholders are involved on each stage, but when we look from the let's say, general point of view, we can distinguish there are three main, oh my, there are three main, main sorry, my buttons doesn't work. There are three main uh, uh, areas of question. First of all, we need to understand what do we want and this is related of, course, related, of course, to the context, to the mission of the institution, to the strategy, but also to the regional, national or international policies, as well as to the financial issues. The other uh, important questions are related, what do we know? So when we want to evaluate, when we want to design the climate control to prevent risk, we need to understand uh, how does risk are related to environment? And the third important question is related to what we can, because when we develop some options to prevent certain risks, we all even if they are theoretically very good, not all of them, they are feasible to be applied in the new zone context. That's very obvious, I think. And to, during my short presentation, I just want to focus your attention on this question. What do we know actual about the risk? And there is a several uh, things which we know. We know, as Stefan mentioned, that uh, active climate control in museums is an expensive thing. Uh, typically, the energy consumption uh, normalized to the square meter of, of the museum varies between 10 and 1,000 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. Uh, uh, which means just simply that when the small museums decide to install active climate control HVAC system, it's very likely that the energy bill will increase several times, if not the orders of magnitude. We know also that in the buildings uh, which are using HVAC system, 95% of energy use is related to control of temperature and humidity. Lighting and other appliances, this is a small part. Uh, this is the third uh, conclusion, uh, is rather my personal experience uh, from the institution in I work uh, in, is that cost of the temperature and relative humidity control is typically comparable or higher than salary cost of all conservators, so people who take her for the collection. So which is why I think the discussion about sustainability in museums without optimizing HVAC system is how to say, insufficient at least. We also understand in general the climate-related risk in the museums, and we can distinguish three major types of the risk. One is the biological risk, which is related to fungal growth and insect infestation. The second risk is related to various types of chemical degradation of objects, and finally, a risk of mechanical damage caused by instabilities of temperature or relative humidity. And again, when we control environment and control variations, this is again the most expensive part. Uh, so definitely, as, I, as we know, and as we can see on the historical object, we see the impact of the unstable environment. Definitely there is a risk of, of mechanical damage, but I would like to convince you that this risk of mechanical damage are frequently and often overestimated. Why it is so? First of all, because the objects were stored for decades, if not for centuries, in unstable, uncontrolled climates. First HVAC system were installed in the uh, museums at the beginning of 20th century, but in developed country, in leading institutions, in leading museums, they become common in 50s and 60s. But still many museums, smaller museums or museums in the historical buildings, they don't have any HVAC system. How looks the environment, temperature and relative humidity in such uh, buildings without potential for climate control. You can see here on this slide, which shows temperature and relative humidity variation 
in the church of Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari in Venice, which house, houses the one of the most important panel painting by Titian, the, the famous Assunta. And as you can see, the temperature, the, the temperature varies between few Celsius degrees and 28 and relative humidity between 30 and 80% of relative humidity. So according to museum standards, this environment, is, this climate is outside of any class of the climate control, but the objects survived well in this environment. Uh, we also uh, know that observation of active damage development are relatively rare, or I would say they are rare, even using very advanced methods of damage development tracing. And as Karen mentioned, I had the, the national, the laboratory, the National Museum in Krakow, which is the largest and oldest museum in Poland, and we took care for the lady with her mind by Leonardo da Vinci. And every few years, we check the state of the preservation. And the object had been for decades stored in the palace, which had the class of the climate control according to Ashray D. I'm also showing the monuments man and the liaison officer, Polish liaison officer, Karol Estreicher, who brings the pa painting from Munich after the war, not only to pay the tribute to, to monuments man, but I wanted to show you in which condition this monument was transported. It was not, it was anything close to stable environment. And we use the laser interferometry to trace damage development, the, the laminations, and also look at the cracks. You can see here two uh, macro photographs of the cracks in the painting, one taken in 2002, another in 2012. And we binarize and digitize, binarize, and play with the computer aid. Uh, the game find a difference and there is nothing we we can see some traces of the of dust and nothing nothing really else so damage development is observed really rarely we also recently understand much better the behavior of the materials uh, my apologies for for this scientific graph which shows in fact the mechanical properties of oil paints and here you have the strain of break which is parameter show uh, telling us about the brittleness. So when the strain of break is lower, the material is more brittle. On the x-axis, we have stiffness. So here's increasing stiffness. And the numbers here, they show, uh, they tell us about the time or age of the sample expressed in years uh, of natural aging. And the oldest samples which were measured by our groups, the oldest in the world, are 30 years old. And we see clear trend. Paints, oil paints with time, they become stiffer and much more brittle. What is not shown here is also that those paintings, they shrink. And of course, this causes that even in stable environment, cracks in paintings and other materials or decorated objects, they will develop independently on climate stability. And you can see here in this famous painting, of course, the, the network, dense network of cracklers, and only some vertical cracks here are related to unstable environment. Uh, there is also more statistical relevant research. I'm showing here the research which were performed by the Rijksmuseum. They evaluated the state of the preservation of 370 decorated oak panels, which are considered one of the most vulnerable to environmental variation. And they compared the state preservation with uh, the, the old photographs, the photographs which are in Rijksmuseum archive, which are more or less 100 years old old and no damage development was noticed in these paintings. And the most uh, statistically relevant data are were presented recently in the impact report by of the government indemnity scheme in UK, in which you can find the data between 2010 and 2022, and in total, almost 30,000 objects were insured within the scheme. And here you can see information about the, uh, the percentage of claims, and mainly they were uh, handling, losses, theft, vandalism, 
fire and nothing, no claims due to unstable environment. So I think this, got, this gives us really a statistical proof, not only anecdotal research about individual objects, but statistical proofs that objects are not as vulnerable to humidity variation as we previously believed. Uh, and all in all, of course, it leads us to conclusion that active climate control to prevent mechanical damage development is very cost ineffective. So it has very low cost effectiveness. This is very important graph which shows the benefit could cost ratio obtained by the Canadian Conservation Institute, which is expressed in number of saved dollars, which certain preventive conservations are uh, were implemented or would be implemented. And this is the cost of the implementation. And on the x-axis, so here is a high cost effectiveness, here is low cost effectiveness. Here, what you can see here, there is a magnitude of risk. So when we are to derive the risk, are very, they are larger. And you can see here from this graph that from the business point of view, dealing only with the large risk makes sense. This is just cost effective. When we go down here, uh, we, we really are, have implemented the ineffective uh, actions and active climate control is located here. So very expensive and very and small benefit to, to the collection. So when you are looking here, more or less the cost effectiveness is that you invest 1,000 uh, 100,000 euros and you save one euro of the collection value. This is very ineffective uh, action. So uh, I'm not a climate activist. I believe that preserving the planet, on the dead planet, there is definitely no art. Uh, but I think that also from the business model point of view, investing a lot and using a lot of energy is very ineffective. And these resources could be used much better for example, to prevent those risks. And in the last slide, I would like also to indicate some gaps in knowledge. Stefan already mentioned about life cycle sustainability ass assessment, which is really missing, particularly in the in the area of preventive uh, prevention or preservation of the collections. But also we don't know what are the relative costs of maintaining various types of climate. So for example, we don't know how much energy, how much we can how much energy we can save when we go from AA to class climate B or C when we relax. Or we don't know also the small institution, they don't know how much their energy bills will increase when they go from D to B. So I will stop in this moment and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lukas. Um, one question to you uh, before we go on with the presentations. Uh, quickly, just a reflection from the room. Uh, I can imagine there was a lot of um, uh, conservatorists and collection keepers and head of collections here who might have been uh, working for years, if not even decades, to improve their uh, storages and their improve the climate conditions in, in their workspaces. And imagine now that they, um, they go back to their museum and the general manager is really inspired by your presentation and says that we don't need to invest anymore into climate control at all. This is all unnecessary. Uh, the things will, the artifacts will uh, survive without all of these uh, things that you have been telling me. Is there some hope you can give to these people, to the collection keepers and the conservatories, that their work is actually important and they, the principles for what they have been uh, working for uh, are still valuable? That uh, the so, so yeah, I wouldn't. Sorry, I wouldn't recommend to go to the directors or decision makers and say all these measures are unnecessary. I would go and say the resources which you are using for that could be used for the other areas of the preservation. So it's the change of the perspective. And uh, in all my consulting, which I uh, did both in US and in some European museums, but also in Poland, I always uh, advise to negotiate. And uh, 
decision-making process, particularly when we are dealing with the millions of objects, we, when we are dealing with high uncertainty, is always very uncomfortable and people are making mistakes. This is true for economy, this is true for uh, for health, for other aspects. So the, making a mistakes is nothing bad. We are always doing that. Just be, uh, as Stefan mentioned, honest and transparent. And I have to say that when you look at the literature and uh, reports about what, because there are definitely some objects which are canaries, which are uh, uh, vulnerable, and we need to identify them. But there is very little information published. This is rather hidden by the institution when they fail. And this is important also to share honestly the information about not all our uh, successes, but failures. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward for all the discussion and the question uh, that we will soon have. But last but not least, we have um, um, Teemu Kirjonen to join us. Um, Teemu is basically back at home because uh, he has been working here uh, for, for years and he was um, actively working with the award-winning project the Carbon Neutral Lahti Symphony Orchestra from 2015 as the general manager of the orchestra at the Sibelius Hall here in Lahti. And uh, he knows this house like his five fingers and is literally back home for the conference. Uh, today, his new professional life has taken him to Turku, where he leads the three museums of the Oba Academy University Foundation. Uh, so we could say a newbie in the museum field, but with a very impressive background in the cultural field, and definitely a, a man of action with, with real practical um, uh, background in, in creating change in the organization. So his presentation, Navigating with the Climate Issues in Different Cultural Fields, explains about his experience working with a symphony orchestra and turning it into a carbon neutral orchestra, as well as his new projects in the museum field. So, Demo, the floor is yours. Good planets are hard to find, as Steve Forbert sang back in 1996, and that's maybe the guideline uh, of my presentation and maybe somehow of this whole topic we are discussing in this conference. Uh, I will be giving a very uh, hands-on and, and a concise presentation about an orchestral project uh, we did here at the Sibelius Hall and a uh, presentation also uh, of a joint project of 13 museums in the Turku area, and also how my, uh, or the three museums I represent are involved in that project. And uh, hopefully this is a kind of a encouragement uh, to think out of the box. That is that we, what, we, what we all need every now and then. And, uh, mm, Yes, that's me, and, and just a kind of brief, uh, now I'm covering some of my background there, but, but, but I will tell you what is there behind. So the, these are the key uh, sentences or, or words uh, why I'm having a kind of double or even triple road, uh, role in this presentation. Uh, I was working for the Lahti Symphony Orchestra, as it was said, uh, in this building. Uh, as a general manager for eight years, but being in the administration for 19 years altogether. So I uh, do know these corners, we are in, in, in quite pretty well. Uh, and, but then uh, I, I changed the uh, working field uh, roughly a year ago, so now I'm, I'm uh, uh, managing the three museums of the Aubo Academy University Foundations foundation in Turku. And, uh, mm, and, and, and a little disclaimer, I have discussed with the present general manager of the orchestra that it's okay that I will present uh, something which is no kind of have a direct connection to me. So that is good done in a uh, good cooperation. Uh, something about this um, uh, project we did with the orchestra, so we uh, launched it in 2015, and I must say that it's only eight years since 2015, but I must say that the world 
was very different uh, in many ways. When we launched it, that okay, a symphony orchestra in Finland start to kind of work with the climate issues, it was seen a very exotic, even weird. Uh, that kind of, what is this all about? And I mean, we can see now, now it's a kind of a part of the everyday discussion, uh, which is uh, very, very good. Uh, so here, briefly, about the uh, establishment of the project. Uh, some key elements. Um, uh, first of all, we had a good uh, collaboration with an association called Storm Warning. And by this association, we had Jouni Keronen, who is one of the leading climate experts in Finland, giving a kind of a uh, same kind of a, um, presentation we heard in, in the beginning of this, uh, this day. So really making us think that, okay, what is going to happen in the world in the next decades? And uh, the association uh, had, had some uh, projects with some artists, but not with a symphony orchestra. And then we started to discuss that, why, why don't we do something with a symphony orchestra here in Lahti? Uh, and, and kind of, I want to stay here for a while, because a very important f thing for me as a general manager was that this can't be something that is discussed somewhere uh, in the management of an organization, and, and then the organization is told that now we are green. Because, uh, uh, so, so what we did first was a workshop uh, with uh, all, all the members of the orchestra, like 75, 80 people, and in the end of that workshop, I posed a question that there would be uh, this kind of possibility to start to work with this kind of project, are we in or not? And it was 100% uh, positive response we got, so, so it was a good basis, but very important for me. And also, uh, another very important point for me was that uh, part of this project was that uh, um, master's thesis was done on the car carbon footprint of the orchestra. So we had this kind of scientific document there, not just that, that okay, especially then that, okay, some, some symphony orchestra, they think that, okay, they want to be green, but, but what is that, and do they, do they know themselves? Uh, so th this was a kind of a um, very important when, when we started to uh, then work with that and, and, and when we have had presented it. Very shortly, I mean, uh, uh, the simple uh, three steps was, was given us uh, so that uh, first examine, or study, then reduce, and then compensate. And, and uh, the branches there which were to be developed were transportation, both the orchestra and, and uh, the audience, energy consumption, pro and producing CDs and, and digital concerts. And, and, and this waste management. No, nothing very surprising, but, but maybe the um, one important thing there is that, as it said in the English uh, abstract, that particularly important is to get stakeholders to participate to, to reduction targets made by the symphony orchestra. So I mean, uh, kind of a simple truth. It, it doesn't make a very big change to one symphony orchestra in Finland to become a carbon neutral, but there's a possibility to uh, kind of be an inspiring example. Well, uh, we had this project launched and everybody was inspired and, and, and uh, did a press release and, and a huge excitement. Now we come out with a great news to the world. And, and, and what happened? Uh, we managed to get one uh, one article, Sinfonia Lahti Aiko Viherpesta, it's inside the regional newspaper. Uh, the Lahti Symphony Orchestra wishes to greenwash itself. Um, and uh, the good thing about this article was that it was very short and unnoticeable, so it was easy to forget. <laughs> uh, so, so, but, but this was, I know, that was in 2015 the case. 
And I must say that we, we had a very good cooperation with the newspaper otherwise, and, and, but, but apparently this was not their case uh, at that time. Uh, but very soon uh, we started to get very interesting uh, partnerships. For example, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was our partner when we had this kind of green button campaign, which meant that uh, when you bought a concert ticket online, there was a uh, possibility to uh, donate money to, to UN certified uh, projects. And, 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 and so, so, so outside Lahti, there was more understanding that, 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 that there could be something, something interesting in, in our actions. Uh, one important thing is that it's not the general manager who is there all, all in uh, all, all the photos, but, but using the musicians. Uh, this is uh, by City of Lahti, they, in connection of the uh, Green Capital project, one, one of the orchestra's musicians there, and there were many of them. Uh, maybe one thing also here about the encouragement that when, when a symphony orchestra, which is part of the city of Lahti, that the city uh, uh, used this project and the orchestra quite, in a quite innovative way. For example, here, one little example. We did a video, or the city did, this is the orchestra, uh, playing uh, with the bicycle helmets on. And when, when a new mayor was needed, uh, which turned out to be then Pekka Timon, and we got a great, uh, great person here with this advertisement. This was his anything in Sanomat, the biggest Finnish newspaper, uh, saying basically that a, a modern professional for a classic task is needed. And I, 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 I like the dynamics and the idea of this, uh, this very well. But, but when searching for, your, for a mayor, use the local symphony orchestra. That's, that's the way to do it. And internally in the orchestra, this was a kind of a recreational day. We had uh, uh, planted uh, some 6,000 spruce trees there. So again, something that you can do which is beneficial and fun and, 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 and something concrete you can do together in an organization. And then the regional newspaper was already kind of better on the same page also with us. Uh, then uh, just to think that this, this uh, uh, as it, this was quite, I would say, innovative back in 2015, so it got a lot of attention and, and uh, uh, publicity, uh, which is in a way very good and, and, and uh, but I, I think the critical thing is that it's, of course, nice to get the attention and, and uh, even some, some, some awards, but I mean, it's about to, to get all along. And uh, there, is, there, there is some process going on there. But, but here is some, some examples I, was, I had a possibility to present in this kind of the zero emissions in summit in New York part of the New York Climate Week. Then there was a BBC Radio 3 Music Matters program. It was, it was part of that, also our project. Then we got this uh, Classical Next Innovation Award uh, uh, in Rotterdam in, in, in the 2018. And here, actually, when this award came, uh, and when, when I, I talked about the involvement of the person, uh, personnel of the orchestra, some people came to me, but, but, uh, it's, it's a bit embarrassing that we are getting these awards and everything, that are we doing enough? And, and I, I think that this is the kind of the best feedback as a manager. Let's see how it goes with this. As a manager, uh, that okay, actually the, 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 the personnel is saying, let's do more. And, 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 and that, that was very... Uh, excellent. Yes, and this just before COVID, we have this ABO conference, which is the Association of British Orchestra, so presented also there. And uh, as, as said many times also during the day here, so, so Lahti was the European cap Green Capital 21, uh, and it was uh, very much used and, and, and international uh, journalists coming. 
coming and all that. Uh, one thing is that I, I have thought there was, was important uh, that uh, it is, you, we have to maintain the quality of uh, our core work and uh, quality of the, our core, core work, and, and, and this is an example that the uh, Green Capital uh, ordered uh, orchestral uh, work from uh, uh, Finnish composer Cecilia Darmström. It was ICE, so ICE, or in case of emergency, and, and, and it got this prestigious uh, prize. Now I'm uh, running uh, quickly uh, the project we have, this is in the beginning, or, or this has been now for, for uh, mm, two years, this climate province of museums in southwest Finland, and this, this are by Maja Talja, who is the project uh, leader of, of, of this uh, joint project of uh, 13 museums. Are having, do we have, we have at least for, for Marinum have, Present there we have have we other mu museums from Turku? No, we the core uh, operators are the Forum Marinum and 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 the, us apparently. And and very quickly, this is a, a um, project that uh, committed to ex execute at least one concrete action by the end of year 23. Uh, everyone has chosen their own path, so 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 that that is maybe the key thing that, that which suits uh, each each of us best the best. And uh, uh, here we have the four topics: environmental management system and certificate. That is what we do in our museums. General improvements of energy efficiency, waste management, and use of renewable energy. Then it's biodiversity and cooperation with stakeholders. And uh, uh, yes, this is about cooperation. The, the cooperation is, is the thing. And it is a kind of pilot, uh, pilot project uh, in, in Finland. And of course, when the project ends in the end of this year, we hope that uh, uh, we will see similar projects here and there in Finland and, and, and maybe outside Finland as well and the closing seminar we are having in, in, in two weeks. Uh, very briefly still giving examples, this is the three museums. I represent the Obo Academy University Foundation, which is an old uh, foundation uh, established to run a Swedish-speaking uh, university, uh, and, and Obo is, is, is Turku, Turku in Swedish, as, as many of you know. Uh, and we decided to uh, do this EcoCompass, this kind of certification we are aiming at. And this is um, a company owned by the Finnish Association for Nature Conservation. And so it is this kind of, not, not for museums only, but, but many festivals have taken this in Finland and, and, uh, and, and, and many other businesses also. And here briefly, it is, has a certain set of things, elements, which must be included in order to uh, get, get this certification. So we have a auditioning for this EcoCompass uh, now in, in the 1st of December. So let's, let's see whether we can make it on the first attempt. Uh, here, very, very briefly, some sub, sub areas, energy, so goal reducing the uh, consumption of electricity, reduce use of heating energy, purchasing, kind of, in, again, involving the staff, all, all the staff must be involved, very important. Travel and logistics, what we, can we do with that? Nature's diversity, we have this kind of garden-like areas in some of our museums, uh, and, and, and material use uh, relating to exhibitions. And, and, and so on. And communications that we also remember to communicate, communicate what we do. Uh, one, one little, I thought that my time was over, but I saw that one minute is there, so, so I, I say one, um, 
that this kind of uh, cl cleaning uh, the, also the, uh, the digital files that we would have as a kind of annual annual day for that. And of course that is something that maybe one re uh, not remembers uh, all the time, but it is also, also the digital material which, which is uh, kind of uh, causing, causing some eco uh, ecological issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tema, so much. Um, one question before we start with the, the panel. Can you already see uh, that there is something you can use from working with the orchestra to now working with the museums? Or is there something the museums can learn from orchestras? Do you see there's something that's uh, valuable for you from a previous experience? Uh, I, I would say that in general it is just this, this uh, thinking out of the box. That you, you first, first of all you have to kind of uh, get out of the box yourself and, and, and then do uh, something that it maybe ha hasn't been done before and, and uh, kind of try to package it it's that way that, that, that it, it can be kind of inspirational for the surroundings. I, I would say that, yeah, maybe if, if there are some elements kind of more detail, in more detail, they are, of course, happy to hear, was, was there some reflection that, okay, mm -hmm. this might, might be for some other organization as well. Okay, thank you. Um, please, Stefan, as well, we can take our seats here, and I hope Lukas is still with us uh, online. Yes, I am. Wonderful, good to see you. Please. <laughs> So for the discussion, I would actually start uh, uh, on a very personal level. Um, you are all strongly advocating for something. Um, what, what was your awakening call? Or, or do you recall the moment something changed in you that led to these topics being so relevant uh, into your uh, uh, professional and, and personal life? Um, maybe Lukas, you can start on, on screen. Do you remember your awakening moment? Uh, I think it was when I became a head of the laboratory at the National Museum in Krakow, and there were so many uh, issues related to preventive conservation, and uh, really I didn't know where to invest the limited resources, not only financial, but the human resources. And then we look also at the cost, and it occurred, as I mentioned, that at the National Museum in Krakow, there is 65 conservators working, and the cost, energy cost, uh, were comparable to cost of their salaries. So, I, when I saw this comp very large imbalance, how much we spent for that, and in fact there was very, let's say, one person responsible for the risk of fire. So then I understood that active climate control and preventing the damage development is absolutely not optimal from the point of view of using limited museum's resources invested in the preservation. So, uh, and the second, maybe I will mention, it was a lecture of Paul Slovic who works on the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian help and he uh, show how many cognitive biases do we have when we make a decision which are related with the high uncertainties? And I understood we are not alone. The other fields, other uh, disciplines, they have very similar problems and they people, that's people nature to make a wrong decision. So it was it. Thank you. Stefan, would you like to go on? Yeah, well, it's similar, right? I share with Vukas uh, a long way in my career. We worked together at Yale University for several years, and it's it's similar. Of course, we are all standing on the shoulders of somebody before us, people like Marion Mecklenburg, Jonathan Ashley Smith, um, you know, many people who, who, who shaped this field. And, and I, I should admit that as a scientist, I was believing for the majority of my career that Lost, losing heritage is a matter of the height of the tide, is the strength of the wind, the earthquake, you know, putting everything into numbers. This is what I was doing for so many years. 
well, and then I was like almost 60 years old and I realized that disaster is actually a social construct. We're losing things not because of the physical parameters, we're losing it because of the social ones. And so I, yeah, I have to admit, I became kind of an activist, a little bit isolated in the museum community. But I can share with you one panel discussion just not long ago with activists from Tuvalu in Berlin. It was a little island in the Pacific Ocean which is going to drown in the next 30, 40 years. It was a young woman, Grace Mali. She was sitting with me on that panel. And I was actually wondering why I am on this panel. I, I, I was never in the Pacific Island. I have no idea about what's happening there. But they brought me because they thought, you know, this is the guy from the museums who's always criticizing new museums and an activist, so, <laughs> so let's bring him here. And, and listening to these activists and to the actually also courage and the optimism of these young activists, because they are really optimistic still. If they would be thinking like me, um, they wouldn't be active and sitting down in the street. So this was kind of the moment I, I decided, okay, I have a few more years left. I'm not going to do anything else than working for climate-friendly museums and green museums. That's beautiful. <laughs> and how about you, Demo? Yes, uh, I kind of referred to that, but I can say it kind of uh, in a little other, other uh, perspective that, that it was this National Orchestra Conference which was held in uh, back in uh, 2015, and it was the very last presentation. It was at, uh, actually at the Sokos Hotel Seurahuone, what many, many of us know, I guess, uh, that the Sunday morning and, and, and uh, this Joni Keronen's presentation there, and, and not many orchestras left there, actually, and the ones who were there were maybe a bit sleepy. But, but anyway, it was, it, it, it was such a strong... Uh, message he gave that at, at, at it made me think that okay there is something and and maybe the thing I want to mention that uh, it was uh, in a way an easy task for me because I happened to have an organization which had developed uh, itself as a kind of quite open for all kinds of projects uh, I don't take credit of that it has it had been kind of been like that long, long before my time. But it was easy to kind of grab that, okay, uh, that at, uh, now there is this climate change. So, okay, we have a symphony orchestra, so why don't we start to discuss? But, but you need this kind of uh, wakening up, apparently, that, okay, now, now. And, and no other orchestra who kind of took uh, this chance and, 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 and then we, we, had, we had our chance and, and it became a very, very uh, rewarding, re rewarding journey, I would say. Mm -hmm. In addition to your personal awakening call, it's really important how the society or the country supports it. And I guess Poland, uh, Finland, Germany can share quite different uh, circumstances or environments in this sense. So how would you say how much, uh, for example, even Finland has changed within these eight years of your, your projects? Uh, at the moment you started, uh, what was the perception in the society and where you are right now? Well, as said, it was, it was seen very, very, very exotic. And, and, and of course, uh, over the years, uh, and now the very recent years, I would say that it has come to, to, to the discussion very dramatically, and, and, and uh, uh, also various cultural institutions have been active. And I think what comes to the kind of cultural fields in Finland, so I, I would dare to claim that uh, festivals have been maybe the most active. Maybe they are kind of uh, as, as uh, organizational structures are quite, quite dynamic also otherwise so, so but the festivals have been kind of mm -hmm. very very active for many years but now kind of these or different kind of institutions coming along so that is that is crucial because this has to be done together yeah. how about uh, poland lukas how open is poland for uh, talking about climate change and uh, and specifically in the museum field Uh, I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Lukas. You are muted. 
Yeah, that's better. <laughs> that's sorry, better. I'm, I'm Thank sorry. You. I, I, I was muted. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, it's progressing. I have to say that recently, uh, ten major national museums they agreed on relaxation of the environment, and the current recommendation are uh, 35, 60 percent of relative humidity. This is absolutely a, a good sign. But generally, I uh, still, as Stefan mentioned, I hope in and believe in young generation. Without they entering to to the museums, without uh, pushing the agenda and be more sensitive, because I believe that works of art, heritage is not more important than human life or the biodiversity. They are conflicting needs, and this discussion, uh, I am unfortunately is not very active in Poland. That's my that's my opinion. Stefan, how about Germany? Well, okay, we always look to Poland. We know that you built a storage facility which has like five or 10 kilowatt hours consumption per square meter a year, while we are building similar facilities with like 50 times more energy consumption in Germany. So how can my perspective be? I, I think I want to give some tribute to, to the Scandinavian countries because Denmark, for example, has been really at the forefront of this development. Um, Sweden, with the University in Gotland, has been at the forefront of this development. We, can, we only look, you know, we look in Germany, and if I read, open the newspaper, and I read that we have been emitting more carbon gases uh, in 21, 5%, almost 4.5% more than in 2020, in Germany, uh, according to the UBA, the Federal Agency for the Environment, I think this is going in the totally wrong direction. Every new museum we build uses more energy than the old one. The one I was just mentioning, costs of building costs of 31,000 euro per square meter this is unprecedented. So it's getting like worse and worse and worse with every. So I, I'm not optimistic, but I'm looking at the Scandinavian countries, and I th I'm wondering why are they. Why are, why are they able to build this storage in Vele for the National Museum? Why are my colleagues and friends in Poland building this storage? Why can't we? And I hope we can learn a little bit from our neighboring countries and then get more optimistic um, for my country too. I'm so sorry, because, because Stefan really mentioned and I feel bad about my country, because that's true. We are building <laughs> two almost uh, passive storages for the National Archive. This is built and operating and the central storage for museums in the central Poland. But I would say that this is because only few, because individuals, they believe that it makes sense. What I was referring to, general discussion and sensitivity of that. So we have successes, but this is because there were few people really engaged in, the, in this action and pursuing with, with the projects. Thank you. Um, when we go more into the, the change, we are talking a lot about change and uh, to, to, to make a change, like Demo described, it's a, it's a specific process uh, already in one organization, not to mention if you want to make a, a change in the society. Uh, so what kind of importance might there be when uh, such change uh, starts uh, from cultural institution? Because we all represent cultural institutions, so what specifically the importance that, uh, that we as cultural institution representatives have, can have in, in uh, driving this change? Um, well, who would be ready? <laughs> well, uh, I would say that kind of one kind of very natural thing for us is that at, uh, in our normal activities, we reach large number of audiences, different kind of audiences. So, so, so we are kind of uh, ready to communicate things with a uh, large, large amount of people. And so, so we have uh, many of us, for example, art in, in different formats and uh, art is of course something that has been kind of communicating with the surround, surrounding societies throughout the decades uh, and centuries. So, so I mean, I, I think that we have a kind of good kit of instruments in our use uh, if, if we use them cleverly. Uh, that, that kind of, just kind of modi modifying the message that it's, it's not something that we are kind of closed institutions 
who, who suddenly needs to need to kind of start to communicate this kind of a, for, for a broader audience. But on the in the contrary, that it, it is it very very natural for us. So kind of that we we remember that we are can be quite influential in in, in this perspective. That kind of uh, encouraging the the. the societies around us. I would agree with Timo when he speaks about the toolkit which we have. I think um, museums, although we had this debate here, you know, we tend to believe that we are like high trust institutions, but I always want to remind you that we are high trust institutions for ourselves, not necessarily for some others. Um, and we are not neutral in any way, but we can be safe places for unsafe discussions. We can be exactly there where others can't. And that's why I would always call museums to be more courageous and actually, as I said before, invite climate activists to the museum. Talk with them, let them not only glue themselves to your painting frames, right? That's what we, but also I don't really like, I have to admit, but um, talk to how they see a museum and the role of the museum and the role of the society in the future. Because um, I think, Timo, you're very right. The cultural institutions have this toolkit and can engage beyond the traditional boundaries. And we should do that much more boldly, much more courageously than we actually do. And, and not be afraid, because we might be surprised who is coming to our museums and who actually engages with this dialogue then. If I can still comment br very briefly, that for example in Lahti, uh, st things started to happen around us. For example, it was the local uh, uh, hockey team, the Pelicans in the National League, who uh, after a while our, our um, project was presented. So they, they launched uh, a similar project that they want to be the first carbon neutral uh, hockey team in the world. So, I mean, it is not only the kind of uh, like-minded uh, around us, uh, in a way. That, that it, Don't get me wrong in that, but we can be like-minded with the hockey players also. But, I mean, <laughs> you can find, find uh, surprising openings yes. where, when you start to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Lucas, would you like to add something? So so, so what Tamil described and Stefan, they, they, I think they, they draw attention to the bottom-up approach. This is very important. So if society wants, that's easy. But it's not always the case. I still believe that there are some there is some room for policy making and top-down uh, approach, because if we want to define or institution wants to define what they want. It's not always necessary that everyone is so sensitive to uh, environmental issues. And having a slight pressure or many projects which I take uh, part in and uh, defining what we want, it's because of the policy. So there is also this important aspect, and I believe in uh, that this is an important tool. It's, it's very good, I'm sorry, <clears throat> that you uh, mentioned policy making. I think a lot of people and a lot of uh, museums feel that um, that is all very overwhelming, uh, that it's, it's really difficult to, to how, how somehow make an impact and change there. So how, how could we help each other? We are still here in, in NEMO conference, that's the organization for all the museum associations around, the, around Europe. How, how is that we could do something to, to make this uh, impact also on the policy level? Or what are the roadblocks we should be aware of uh, uh, while trying to make this change? <laughs> I, can, I can start. I mean, uh, the first thing is the connection, the network. I mean, to collaborate, to exchange, to be, as I said, more transparent and open about your climate data, for example. Um, I think if you have a big impediment for, for a, a real ecological transformation of museums, are actually loan agreements, are actually legal procedures. So. Um, but we are, as Vukas is showing, and in my research too, and, and many other colleagues, is we are operating in a, in a kind of a Kafkaesque theater situation here. That um, if museums would be collaborating more openly and would say, okay, we, we share our data, we want to have this data accessible to everybody, that would be a huge step forward because then. 
for example, and I'm dreaming now, <laughs> for example, in the loan agreement, one could change from the policy side that you can only request climatic condition from the institution which gets your painting if you can assure the same conditions at home. It sounds logical, but it's not the case. You can say you want to have 50% plus minus 5, and at home you're not even ASHRAE class C. That's possible. So I think that would be a good policy. Another good policy would be if ministries, federal ministries, for example, in Germany would say, well, I want you to do a benchmarking for your energy, for your climate. Not for the CO2, by the way. You, you will have noticed that neither Lukas and me were speaking about carbon balances because conversion factors are changing every year. Um, it opens the floodgates of greenwashing. But if you compare energy consumption, how much energy do you really need for your museum? And then compare it to another one. I think that could help a lot. So I think collaboration and networks in, in the museum community would be really, really a strong asset. And, and we do it. I mean, we see it with the Museum Spond, with Nemo, with others. I think it's, it's, it's one of the things which get definitely better than they have been 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank so you. if I can join the discussion, Stefan, and I'm a little bit less optimistic than you, for example, sharing the, the information would help. Because I know that, uh, or, or what you mentioned about the loans, some I know some institutions which demand very uh, airtight or, or sorry stringent parameters for the loans agreement just to limit the loans, and it's used as a tool to uh, create shape the loan policy, and I I believe like in New York for example I remember. Ten years ago, I had a, a discussion about energy use at the Metropolitan Museum, and they were not interested so much. Now the city introduced the demands, the reduction of the energy consumption. So I don't think that it comes, unfortunately, from our sector. It comes from, from general discussion. And this, is, I think, is a driving factor. Well... Not uh, much to add. Uh, I, I think the, these kind of events and, and networking and sharing the ideas is, is, is the is the thing. And I, I don't know how much we kind of compete with each other otherwise. But I think this is definitely not that kind of battle. The, there is a battle, but that it is a joint battle against yes. uh, uh, something yes. to totally something different. Yeah. Well, let's uh, share ideas then. We have uh, a bit time for questions for the audience as well, because uh, um, time is really going fast with these uh, discussions here and, and really relevant topics. So if there's anybody who would like to use the chance and ask a question from somebody from the panel, now it's, it's the opportunity. Just raise your hand and you will be handed over a microphone. Okay, from them. Yeah, it's a, a, a brilliant presentation. It's really interesting, um, unlocking a lot of kind of ideas and thinking. Um, but just a, a really simple question. Is the care of collections and objects paramount? Um, because I don't know, I'm sure you're aware, the Bezo group of museum directors has just republished, uh, refreshed its um, guidance. And there's lots of good stuff in that. But it says the care of collections, objects is paramount. And... And, and I was surprised by that, so I'm, I'm interested in your responses. Um, Lukas, would you like to begin uh, with? I, I absolutely sure. Uh, I, I, I don't know, if, but I'm hearing you. I think that uh, when we have, a, we live in times with when there are different conflicting needs, we need to uh, balance between them. Unfortunately, I think we cannot preserve everything. Uh, we need to make, because just the preservation is not for free, so I wouldn't say that it's paramount. I think there are also other important issues and open discussions or, or societal needs, and open uh, discussions is very needed about that. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Wukash. <laughs> I, 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 I think similarly. You know, Leonardo da Vinci said, with water and time, everything changes. And I'm, I, when I get up in the morning and I look into the mirror, I think he was right every morning. So I think we have to allocate resources, right? And it's risk management. So mm -hmm. something we can save, but we will not save everything. And actually, um, I think everybody knows that, right? That we're going to lose 
a lot of our heritage. And the idea to save something for the eternity um, is not going to work on this planet. Uh, for nothing. I mean, really nothing. Also not for objects in museums. So, um, but I'm saying this as somebody who works 40 years, and if I have to describe my work in a nutshell, it's like just making art and cultural heritage survive sustainably for future generations. That's my job, but it's not possible for everything. Another and one? if I can add, I think that this ethical stance is, of course, uh, giving some mandate to, to speak about that. But I think that the pandemia and COVID pandemia, they showed us that uh, we uh, have to choose. We, we have limited resources. And the question is how to use this limited resources for the best benefit of the society. And, and there is no escape that, unfortunately, some people will die. And sorry for saying that. Thank you, Lukas. Um, we have a question. Well, firstly, I want to thank you for making me feel a lot less bad about the state of our collection <laughs> units, because we have absolutely zero co atmospheric control in them. The best is that the house is heated, and that's not even true for most of them. Then again, we are a mining museum, so most of our items are pretty rugged, but and I'm not very familiar with the Ashra, but when you said no climate controls, I suppose you still meant that they would be in a heated location, like in a, in a building with four walls and a roof and so, some sort of heating inside that you don't let the temperature fluctuate from plus 40 to minus 30 and stuff like this. Thank you. I think this was more like a, a comment from a reflection of, of these topics that you've heard. It's, it's very nice to hear that. Um, anybody else for, for questions? There's one at the back. Thank you. I was wondering, I mean, when I listen to you, it's like doing less damage to like lose less energy and so forth. But what are your thoughts about doing something completely different? Like instead of just fixing a system that doesn't really work, then trying to create a new system. So how do you see the future of your professional life in that view? Could you explain what you mean by doing something totally different? I would be very curious because it might be interesting. <laughs> uh, well, the, the system that we had broke the planet. So we're all focusing on doing less of all the bad stuff. But it's still within the same system. So we, at the same time as ah. doing less damage, we also have to invent a completely new way of doing things. Yeah. So it's sort of going back to the more radical idea of yeah. changing our sector. Can I, yeah, now, now I understand. I, I, in the first moment I thought you think, or you expect us to think about better HVAC systems. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 just from my personal point of view, I, I, I come from Bavaria, from the mountain side. I have a forest. Um, I will probably work in my forest a little bit the next years. And learn, learning from the forest is that symbiosis and collaboration is much more successful than competition. You just have to walk through the forest and you learn this. This is a, kind of a battle going on, but it's going very slowly. And, and it's not about competition. And for me, I think, this is kind of the lesson, right, that this, um, as I also said in my short statement, that the things which we did for the last 50 years, and actually, let me remind you that climatization in museums we have in Europe only since the late 60s. We have the Mies van der Rohe in 1969 was one of the first climatized buildings in Germany, um, next to the Volkwang Museum in Essen and the Germanisches Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg. It's these 50 years of my life where we shifted the Earth Overshoot Day from December 29 in 1971 to May 3rd in this year. So I totally agree. We have to do something entirely different. And not like the politicians in my country said, I was in a, in a meeting in the ministry a few weeks ago, said they, we need a 360 degree turn. You know, I'm still scientist enough to know that <laughs> if we do that, we're exactly where we are before, we are. right? <laughs> what we need is a 180 degree turn. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, one or two more questions from the audience. Okay, here in the middle, there is one. 
Is there somebody with a microphone available? Hi, thank you. Um, nice to see you here. Um, I have a question not about the climate activists this time, Stefan, so don't worry. Um, uh, and thank you for mentioning the, the storage that we're building. So I know, I think very well how, how much criticism it had to take and it's still taking um, in Poland, but still we're building it. Um, uh, I wanted to ask because I found your presentations very convincing in terms of uh, climate control and stuff and I know a little bit about it. However, how does this relate to the rule that we've been told to obey for many, many years, which is the rule of sustainability, where we are supposed to protect our heritage in order to pass it on to further next generations in unchanged condition? Um, you said that perhaps we don't have to um, protect it for eternity. Where is, you know, the, the, the thin line? I mean, sustain sustainability doesn't seem to go in line with this. Well, yeah. Um, thank you, Paulina. I, 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 I would say that there's, a, there's already an intrinsic problem with the museum core mandate to collect things and to build a collection larger and larger and larger. Um, that's already a little bit of a problem with the sustainability principle. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, um, I think once we manage, we, we, I mean, we, we have to, good preservation is actually managing sustainable preservation, managing the change, because we have a change. We have a change all the time. We have a change in the intangible part, we have a change in the tangible part. Um, it would be naive to say, well, we preserve things we have, for eternity, because it's not going to work. We have, as Vukas, and Vukas, you may correct me, we have to make a choice. When we look at September 2018, Rio de Janeiro, and 18 million objects burning in one night, that's a lot of change. And probably, I would say, that's way too much of a change for one night. So if I can um, decide where do I put my resources, I would rather put it to a good fire protection than into the HVAC system, especially since I learned from Bukas today that you gain one euro if you invest 100,000. So that's not really a great investment advice, Bukas. Thank you. So you can you can you can develop your collection. You can decide to invest into research, which uh, in, improve the knowledge about the collection. There is so many actions. We are what we are just saying that uh, very precise climate control is is unsustainable in terms both of the energy and it's not just efficient. But I agree with Stefan, unfortunately, because we have limited resources, we cannot uh, hope for unchanged in, even in the decades with the objects. So no changing to the objects into decades, that's just not gonna to happen. Thank you. Thank as you, Lucas. With, as, as with our life, we are just dying, sorry. To finish this panel with a slightly more positive note, hopefully, for a very, very quick last comment from everybody. What's the one thing you take away from today as something hopeful that you are going to do or change or something when somebody's struggling? What's, what's there that I can do? What's your message to them? Tomorrow, when you go home, do this and, and you will have an impact. What would you recommend, Demo? Well, I would say that it's, of course, we have, are facing uh, huge problems and challenges, but of course, one has to um, try to do uh, uh, his or her best at that, that the future will be anyway better than it, it is now. And, and, and I, I mean, shortly referring, for example, to this uh, uh, green capital year uh, here, here in Lahti, so I mean, uh, what kind of you have had to leave something behind, but actually there were, for example, these mm -hmm. clean tech uh, companies and new businesses were arising. But but you need to close one door in order to to, to open new ones. Thank you, uh, Lukas. Your final. I think message. I think it was mentioned several times. I think we. We hope, I hope, for honest discussion, and this is very important. Some some of our beliefs, they will not hold in future, they will be new one, and just discussion, there is no other way to progress. Thank you. 
and Stefan. Yeah, the same. I mean, the discussion is important. We may disagree on a lot of things, but we might still find a lot of things which overlap, uh, especially in the climate crisis debate. Uh, emotions are maybe more important than facts, you know, that's difficult to say for a scientist, but it's probably the truth of my experience that you can connect with people through emotions. So I would say, I will be, if I would be a hockey supporter, if I would know something, I would support the Lahti hockey team. <laughs> that's a, a really very convincing um, way to address climate change and climate crisis here in Finland. So I would take this with me. I'm a supporter of your hockey team here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody here in the panel. Thank you for the questions and everybody for staying here. If I can have your attention for 20 more seconds, um, we have a challenge in our museum in Tallinn and Vavamo right now, which is the darkest and most depressing time of the year, the autumn here in the northern, northern hemisphere, that we need to use those reusable film cameras and take pictures of moments when we feel content and happy and joy. And I would really like to take a picture of this audience here, if you don't mind. Just a second. Okay, ready? This will be archived and preserved for all the future generations. One, two, three. Good, thank you. Have a nice day.